the Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. Welcome to the Instructor Podcast. This is a show that helps you become an even more awesome driving instructor and run a better driving business. As always, I am your experimental host, Terry Cook, and I'm delighted to be here, but even more delighted that you have chosen to listen because we are back with the fifth episode of season eight, and I'm delighted to announce that Bright Coaching have continued their sponsorship throughout season eight. And to find out more about what Bright Coaching have to offer, including the new online cohort, head over to brightcoaching.net or you can find them at the Intelligent Instructor and NJC Expo in Newark on September the 29th. But on this episode, myself and Laura Morris are discussing failure. What is it? How can we utilise it? And what are some of the times that we have failed? Now, this episode takes some interesting turns and I'd love your feedback, so let us know if we failed. But... Just before we dive in, I'd like to point you in the direction of the Instructor Podcast website, where you can get access to the entire back catalogue of episodes, all of our free resources, and find out more about the Instructor Podcast Premium. Head over to theinstructorpodcast.com. But for now, let's get stuck into the show. Today on the Instructor Podcast, I am joined once again by Laura Morris. How are we doing, Laura? Hey, I'm good, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me, as always, on this uh, little mini-series we're doing. And today we're going to kick off by talking a bit about failure. And I think we want to start off with what, what do we mean by failure? I think when we talked about recording this episode, I, I struggled because I don't know, what do you class as a failure? What, 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 would you, what, what is a failure? So to me, it's something when something goes wrong. So if my car breaks down, I see that as a fail. Now, it's not my fault. I mean, it could be potentially, <laughs> but you know, it's not a fail on my part, but it's like a failure to my day. There is a fail within my day, something that's gone wrong. But there's also the other side, which is I could fail a test and that, that's my fail. So I think there's different ways around that. But the way I view it is anything that's gone wrong. And it, it's interesting because... I put up my post on Fridays in my Facebook group, the, the Friday fail post, and I encourage people to talk about the stuff that's gone wrong that week. And that's kind of our phrase. It's called the Friday fail, but I say what's gone wrong this week. And I'll get all kinds of different responses in there. Some that you might consider a proper fail and others that you might consider something going wrong. I think I like the way you described it in terms of failure. It doesn't have to mean fault. You know, a fail doesn't have to be your fault. It, like you say, it could just be something that's gone wrong within, within your day. I like the way you described that. And I think the first example I'm, uh, that I'd like to talk about is driving tests and driving test fails. And again, in the context of what is a fail, because I'm, I'm going to give two examples and I'll be interested in your thoughts. Well, good job I'll be interested in your thoughts because it's <laughs> like a very different episode. But the learner that passes with 15 driver faults where the examiner's looking for a reason to fail them because they weren't great. And then you've got the learner that fails with one serious, but zero driver faults, where the, the examiner's gutted, they've had to fail them. Now, technically, there's a fail and there's a pass there. But if you step back and look at it, is it potentially a way around? Mm-hmm. I suppose then also the question is, you know, does passing with 15 faults mean that there's a, a fail there does that does that mean that they're a bad driver <laughs> could do and this is the again if we use that specific example and i suppose i'm putting it forward as that example someone that's got 15 faults and probably shouldn't be on the road but the examiner couldn't fail them is kind of the example i'm using that's not the best result if we're just looking specifically at the result aspect 15 driver faults is not a great result there's there's Lots of faults there. Whereas if you look at a one serious driver fault with a, a clean sheet, yes, all right, this is serious, but there's 14 less faults. But again, what is the serious fault? So for me, it's all about that. It's all a failure is what we make of it. So if you pass, you should be celebrating. You've just passed your driving test. You 100% should be celebrating. But for me as an instructor, if someone passed, now I've actually never had this, but if someone passed with 15 driver faults, I would be reflecting on that quite heavily and thinking, 
is that what I wanted, would that person have been better off failing? And when, in the same way, when I've got someone that, that fails with one serious and the rest driver, it almost makes me think the other way. I, I agree. And I, when, when I passed my driving test, I got 14 faults. And, and obviously I passed, but I did pass with 14 faults. And in a way, if I had have failed, it would have then prompted me to get more training, more experience, more, more lessons, and then, and then go again. And actually, you know, that reminds me about my, my part three. So I, I failed my part three twice and then passed my part three on the third attempt. Looking back, I've always said, I and mean, obviously at the time I was gutted, I was frustrated, and it was a long process. And it's, you know, training to be a driving instructor is quite often harder than people kind of realize. But I, looking back, I, I've always said I'm glad that I failed twice because it did prompt me to then seek a different trainer. And then I ended up with two different trainers for my first attempt, my second attempt. And then I ended up training with Lou, Lou Walsh, for my third attempt. And I then, of course, passed my, my third attempt. And I'm glad that I failed because although it was gutting, it meant that I could get better training. And I would never have got that training if I hadn't have failed. And sometimes I think, what if I had just passed with a 31? So for those maybe PDIs who are listening who aren't aware, your, your pass mark is 31 and you have to get eight or more in risk management. And if I had passed with 31, I could easily have passed and then walked away thinking, it's okay, I'm good. I, I'm good at what I'm doing. I've passed. And then not seek to, uh, seek to sort um, any more training. But actually, if I'd have passed with 31, personally, would I consider that a fail in my own brain? Because actually, I've only just scraped a pass. I always say to PDIs, if you pass with 31, that's a pass. And you've scraped a pass, great. And that's, it's not a bad thing. But don't let your training stop there. Don't let your, your you know, training and development stop there. Does that make sense? Complete sense. And, and I'll, I'll tell you for why. Because the, the worst thing that happened to me was passing my standards check six months after my part three. Because I, I, I think I got 32. It was really, really kind of scraping. It was around that 32 mark. And I was really happy. The, the only thing I cared about was passing. Because I... We spoke about this previously. I did the old PSTs and then went in and did the standard check six months later. So I had to completely change what I was doing to, to client set of learning and, and then a very different type of test. So for me, it was like, right, okay, I'm going to pass this. And I, that's all I'm bothered about. And when I passed, because I got a bit wrapped up in that idea of, oh, I must have done well because I've gone from doing this to this and managed to change all this. And I took my fourth pedal. And not like altogether, as in stop doing everything, but I got a bit, a bit cocky, a bit complacent. I thought I was better than I was. If I'd have got 30 instead of 32, I would have gone and got more training. But because I got 32, let's use a 31 example, because it may have been 31. If I'd have got 30 instead of 31, I would have gone and got more training because I'd have failed. But because I got 31, I didn't get training. So a one point difference in a standards check is a difference between me going and getting further training. Now I did eventually go and get further training because that's, that's who I am. But I wonder how many instructors out there that do that, that a couple of points difference is going to be the difference in whether they develop or not. And ultimately it could just literally be one point. So what they're saying is if I'm 30, I need to develop more. If I'm 31, I don't. I, I agree. And quite often we see PDIs talking about similar things in the PDI group. We often hear that, you know, I was only one point off. But actually, even if you're one point off, you've still got however many points until 51. And even if you got 31 and passed, you're still missing 20 points. There's still 20 more points for you to get. Same with the theory test. 
So the pass mark for the theory test is 85 out of 100. And across the four bands that you've got, band one, two, three, and four, you have to score at least 20 out of 25. And quite often we see PDIs just scoring one point off in one of the bands or just being one point under the pass mark. And like you say, they don't, sorry, they do then go and get more training because they need to, to go and pass their part one. But then sometimes I see passes of part ones where people have just scraped it and they're still missing several points until you get to 100. But they see it as a pass and therefore they see it as, okay, I've done that, let's move on to part two. And it it, it does make me sad because I think there's always room for learning, for developing, for, for going forwards. And it's a tricky one because how do you promote and encourage people to go and get training if they've passed you know because people see it as a a tick box I've passed my test job done let's carry on and we can reflect that back to what we were saying before about the learner test in the person that fails with one serious driver fault but zero sorry one serious fault but zero driver faults they're going to come back for more lessons to take the test again the person that passes with 15 driver faults is off on the merry way. They're not going to come back for more lessons a lot of the time. Obviously, there's exceptions to every rule. And for me, I just wonder if we need to, in in those specific situations, we need to take the focus off of the technical result and look at the big picture. So when you're coming to a stand, well, you stand a check as an example, because you pass your part three, you're going to have a stand a check. In theory, you know, God knows what's going on at the minute, right? But we'll use that as the example. Should you be going into a standards check thinking, well, regardless of the outcome, this is what I'm going to do afterwards? Maybe if I get an abysmal result and, you know, it's up to the individual what they class as abysmal. But maybe if I get an abysmal result, I'll do more. But I'm going to do this anyway and not base the further training upon potentially a difference of one point on a check. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think there needs to be more emphasis on it's not about the result, it's about the bigger picture. And do you think that's how we then, or that's the thing that's going to help us handle fails? And again, we'll stick specifically to the, the sort of these test examples for a minute. Because if we're not hanging everything on the result, which could be the, it could be the difference in one point, you know, 30 to 31, for example, or 84 to 85, you know, it could be the difference in one point. If we're not hanging everything on the result and we're looking at the big picture and going, well, this is what I'm doing anyway, is that going to take the pressure off the test and then we're not actually worried about the fail so much? Quite possibly. And I think people would be better equipped and they would have the resources behind them. Regardless of the outcome, they know that they've done the training, they know they've done things to improve. And like I said, it's not about the results. It's about the, the bigger picture and your lessons and everything going forwards. I want to know your thoughts on this because one of the things that I talk about with my learners is the the examiner doesn't decide if they can drive. We decide if they can drive because if they can't drive, they're not going for the test. So we both need to agree that you are an independent state of driving. So the examiner just decides if you can do it legally. And I often find that when they buy into that, and not everyone does, you know, hold my hands up, but a lot of them do. When they buy into that, they're going with a lot less nerves because they're going believing they can drive because their opinion is, I can drive. The person that's been sat with them for 40, 50 hours' opinion is, they can drive. Now it's just up to the examiner to decide if they can do it legally. It's an interesting thought, and I, and I agree, I think, I'm not sure what I think. It's an interesting thought. So for, let's bring it back to that then. So someone fails. Let's use the standards check slash part three example. It's easy to let that fail affect you. So, we, you know, we use a specific example of failing the test. It's easy to let that fail affect you. What advice would you give to people that fail in terms of how to handle that not just in terms of training going forward but how to handle that feeling of failure that's a good question i think everyone handles failure differently and everyone will process that differently 
And like you say, there's the element of training and getting better and, and going forward with that. So definitely getting some training. But in terms of handling failure, I think taking time to reflect and being kind to yourself. You're allowed to sulk. You're allowed to have a moment. You're allowed to just sit with those feelings and, and feel whatever it is you are feeling. That's okay. But don't let yourself drown in those feelings. So, you know, talk to someone and just, even if it's just a brain dump and vent and just rant, talk to someone and just know that someone hears you and, and listens. I think, like I said, I think everyone does handle failure differently. Some people might decide to just dust themselves off, pick themselves up and crack on. Some people might take that failure a little more personally or heavily and it might weigh them down quite a bit. And then it's a real struggle sometimes to pick yourself back up. So I think definitely sharing your thoughts with someone. What else would you be doing? Well, I just want to touch back on, because you said about sulking, <laughs> and I'm glad you've said that, because I fail a lot, a lot of the time. Lots of little things and some big stuff. And I love a good pity party. That's how I refer to it. And I, I always think that the length of the sulk or the pity party is dependent on the fail. So if I stub my toe, I'm going to sulk for about a minute and then I'll crack on. But when my dog died, I sulked for two years. You know, so the, the, the length of the pity party will do, depend on the severity of the fail. But I, I actually think that's one of the, the biggest things we can do is to get it out of your system but then also learning when to draw a line and move on. And something we've spoken quite a lot on these episodes we've recorded is the idea of reflecting. What went wrong? Why did it go wrong? And what could we have done differently? And that's non-judgmental. There's no point looking back and criticizing yourself for it because it's too late. Unless you've created a time machine that I don't know of, you can't go back and change it. So we look back and we go, all right, yeah, I could have put more time into my training. I could have done some work on the theory. I could, you know, whatever it might be, there's things that we can do. So what we do is we look back and go, right, what of that can I bring into this going forward, whether it's for a test or what, whatever it is, what, what from that fail can I learn from and bring in? So for me, they're the two biggest things. It's allowing yourself time to sulk or throw a pity pie. And it's also that idea of what can I take from this to make myself better? I completely agree. And, you know, like I said, you're allowed to sulk. And ultimately, though, it then comes down to moving forwards. What can you do differently? And learning from things. And we, we always make mistakes. We always have fails in, in different forms. But learning from it and moving forwards is, is the important thing. There's a lot of binary in this industry, pass or fail, you know, with the theory, the the driving test, the part two, the part three, there's a lot of binary pass or fail stuff on this. And I wonder if we should be talking about it more because we all talk about the positive side. You know, we all sit here and, and say, oh, well, you'll pass this and you'll achieve this and I did this and I did that. But there's very few people out there actually put that, that voice out and say, I struggled with this today. So whether you want to term this as failure or, or what's almost irrelevant to the topic, but... We never, or we rarely see that. I'm struggling with this. Do you think we need to do that more? I think we do. What, why do you think we don't see it? This is a, there's a vulnerability there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I think there's always more than one reason. And I think one is a vulnerability. If, if I went on to, let's drive an instructor Facebook today and said, I'm struggling with this aspect, there's a concern for me, like, well, what's the response going to be? Are people going to stop subscribing because they're just going to think I'm shit? Because why would I listen to Terry if he's struggling with this? You know, I think there's also that, that thing of being judged by your peers. You know, is anyone going to, so for me, is anyone going to come on the show? You know, so that's going to, that, that judgment aspect is going to be different for everyone. But there's also the vulnerability of just admitting he didn't, because we don't see anyone else do it. So when I think of Laura Morris, I think of someone that's really successful and that's really good at their job. I don't see Laura Morris as someone that's failed at loads of stuff. But yet, as we've recorded these episodes, you've spoke quite a few times about the two attempts you had at failing the, 
not two attempts at failing, two failed attempts at the, the part three. Mm -hmm. And you've been quite open about that, but I don't see that. So for me, it's like, well, Laura Morris doesn't fail at a part three. Bob Morton doesn't fail at his part three. So-and-so doesn't fail at his standard check. So why would I talk about it when all these other people must just pass first time because they're amazing? I think that's where social media can be very deceiving, I suppose. Because naturally, yes, when you, you run a business or you're in an influential position, naturally you're going to be sharing the positive stuff. You're going to be sharing the good stuff. You're going to be sharing everything that's going well. You're going to be sharing, you know, positive information and stuff about your, your business or what you're doing. You know, I'm not generally, or trainers are not generally posting about all the times they failed or what went wrong. And uh, I think in a way that does need to change because like I say, social media can be dangerous in that sense because it can be po positive in a negative way. And yet, yeah, like you say, people see all the positives and then feel like their own failures or negatives aren't valid or they're the only ones who fail. Take the PDI group that we've got, for example. So the PDI group is open to any PDI, regardless of who you're training with. So therefore we get such a range of PDIs and we've got 2,300, 2,400 PDIs in the group. And every Sunday we kick out the ones who pass, okay? And they go into our green side group to get more support that's relevant to them as a, a new ADI. So it does mean that the PDI group is just for PDIs. But then it means everyone is posting their passes. They're posting their part three passes. They're posting that they've passed today. They've got a good score or maybe they've scraped to pass, but they've passed. And we get on average maybe five to 10 part three passes a week. But then we don't get as many fails being posted. However, let's say we, we probably get around three or four fails posted a week compared to the five to 10 passes. But we do get, let's say for every one pass that's posted in the PDI group, we probably get three messages from PDIs who have failed. So, you know, if you're looking at 10 passes in a week, we're looking at 30 fails. And we're getting messages from those PDIs who didn't want to post it on a, on a sort of open forum, on an open group. So, and I... I I feel bad that people don't feel able to share so publicly, even though obviously Lou's PDI group is a private group, but there is still two and a half thousand PDIs in there. And I feel bad that people don't want to openly share their fails. And I understand why. I, like you said, there's that vulnerability. You feel exposed and you feel like you might be the only one, but you're definitely not alone. PDIs fail, and it's not just PDIs failing part three. It's, in general, fails, people don't often post fails. And maybe slightly off topic, but, you know, I've had a lot going on in the last two years. And I've put up a couple of posts, but generally I don't talk about it. Not because I have an issue with talking about it, but just because... I don't feel like people want to hear about that sort of stuff. Like, why would people want to hear about how shit my life has been over the last two years? I think you're 100% wrong. <laughs> I think people are interested. And I think part of that is because they care. And part of that is because, it, let's talk this industry specifically, we put people on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. Put Laura Morris on a pedestal. Not ever goes wrong with Laura Morris. Well, it does. And the fail that you've had there might not have been like a test fail, but you've had crap go on in your life, like health, whatever, that you've struggled to deal with for whatever reason. And I think that talking about that, it, this is just my opinion, talking about that can make other people feel better in the way of, if they're struggling, they can see they're not alone. If they can see the... the that Laura Morris is struggling with this thing or, or Terry is struggling with this thing. It can make people go, oh, it's not just me. Because I've used this example before and it's, it's always intended as a positive example. I'm always worried it might come out the wrong way. But like Bob Morton, 
when I when I think of coaching, I think of Bob Morton. And I look at it, I think, well, I'll never be as good as Bob. So why should I try? That's always my first thought process. And then it's like, no, no, I'm still going to try. I still want to try and be as good. But then every now and again, I'll speak to Bob and he'll tell me something that he struggled with. And it's like, oh yeah, because he's human. But we don't always see that. We see the public face inside. So I really believe that open up about this stuff. And, and look, I am really open with stuff. And I've done this more this year in particular. The Friday fail is the, the example. I try to get people talking about stuff more. And I've been really open on my page about where stuff has gone wrong. And even if it's not necessary stuff that's gone wrong, but stuff I'm struggling with. I spoke when we've been recording today about how I struggled after season seven, thinking of what's to do next. Is this podcast still needed? Is it, is it still relevant? And I do. I think that when you talk about that, you help people. And yes, there's a line. It's not one of one. <laughs> we don't want to read it every day, you know. Like give us some cheeriness as well. I get that. And I think also, like you say, people care. And I, I think having the right people around you is important, mm. especially when it comes to if you've got a struggle, whether it's work-related, whether it's personal or whatever it might be. And having the right people around you is, is really important. And I am fully aware and appreciative of the fact that, you know, so many instructors do care. And when I have posted on the odd occasion, about some things that have been going on in the last couple of years, you know, that's been met with actually a lot of positivity and a lot of people offering their support. And I, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate that. And I, I take the time to like and reply, if I can, to every comment because I, I genuinely appreciate that. But having good people around you is important. And, you know, for example, uh, Okay, maybe, maybe this is going too much into it. So in terms of things that have been going on in my life, I've had some really serious health issues and also some mental health issues that have kind of got worse. And this year, yeah, my mental health was, was quite rubbish at the beginning of the year. And I'm really fortunate in terms of Go Green to have Blaine and Decalion who have been really supportive and they've picked up the slack. They've taken on other things. They've done what they can when they needed to and they've been there to talk to and they, they've been really great. And even things like doing our fortnightly Go Green Zooms. Now, of course, Lou used to do the Go Green Zooms. I used to do the Go Green Zooms with Lou every fortnight. And that's what we did. And I always said to Lou that I wanted to start doing more Go Green Zooms, taking more of that sort of leading role within that. But I, I struggle with self-confidence. Self-confidence is a massive issue for me. And... And then Lou obviously passed away in August last year. Well, yeah, August last year. It's actually really weird to think it's been just over a year. But I, yeah, Lou, Lou passed away, bless her. And then suddenly the Go Green Zooms, that was on my shoulders. And I was like, shit, <laughs> what, what do I do? I, I've, I'm not a natural presenter. I, I don't, I struggle with the confidence and I'm really lucky that at the time I had, um, people around me that could have really supported me. Um, and I will mention them because they, they were great. Um, we, we had Diana Todd and we also had, um, Phil Cowley and they were great and they did the Zooms with me. And then, um, as we sort of evolved Go Green, uh, Decalion joined and myself and Decalion with, within Go Green have been doing the Zooms since. But I, I'll never forget that support because I needed that support at the time. And without the support of Diana and Phil at the time, and then going on to doing the Zooms with Decalion, I don't honestly know what would have happened with the Go Green Zooms because I, I wouldn't have felt confident enough to do it by myself. But to know that I had the support of the other people around me, I carried on and I could do it. And that meant that PDIs who were subscribed to Go Green, they didn't miss out on their Zooms. They still got the training they needed. And I feel strongly about them getting the training that they deserve. And that shouldn't be affected just because I haven't got the confidence to necessarily take a leading role in a, in a Zoom. And I'm more comfortable with it now, you know, as obviously time's gone on. We're just taking a brief pause to give a shout out to some of our latest premium members, and they are Alistair, Juliet Ritzmer, and Kim Gibson. 
These folks have decided to upgrade their CPD and get immediate access to some of the best training and development resources available to ADIs and PDIs, including training things on like coaching, mindfulness, mental health, and the standards check. They also get access to some of the best minds in the industry, like Bob Morton, Emma Cottington, Ray Seagrave, and Tom Stenson. Plus, they even get some more from me, but don't let that put you off. To find out more, or to sign up for a free week's trial, head to theinstructorpodcast.com or use the link in the show notes. And I also want to take a moment to point you in the direction of Bright Coaching, who recently announced a new online version of their accredited qualification in coaching, behavioural change and driver psychology. The first online cohort kicks off on October the 31st, making this year's Halloween extra special. To find out more or to sign up to the newsletter, head to brightcoaching.net. But for now, let's get stuck back into the show. But, you know, I... Ew. I almost look back and think of it as a fail, but actually looking back, it wasn't a fail because I had people around me that I could rely upon and ask for support and get help with. So... I do think having the people around you is important and I will just kind of put a bit of a, a shout out there that if you are sitting there listening to this thinking, I don't have anyone around me, please just message me or Terry, like we will always listen. I'd much rather you message me and just say, hey, I just want to chat on events, just brain dump, doesn't bother me. I'll, I'd rather listen and just allow you to feel heard than for anyone to sit there thinking that they don't have anyone they can talk to. I think I struggle with, like you said, people putting me on a pedestal. I remember once, I think it was last year or the year before, and we was at the conference, and someone came to me and said, oh, I'm so glad I've met you. And I was like, oh, it's nice to meet you too. And they said, it's like meeting royalty. And I was like, whoa, hold on a minute. I I'm, just, I'm just me. Like, I'm, I'm me. You can message me, you can call me, you can talk to me. And Terry, I know you, I'm sure you feel the same. Like, you know, you're there for people to talk to as well. We're not just people who do all of this stuff and then we're not contactable and not there for people. I think it's interesting when you talk about you're not self-confident. Because I reckon that most people that will hear you come on this podcast and spend six to 10 hours talking to me and go on other podcasts and, and turn up at conventions and expos and whatever they decide to name it on that particular day will not believe that you're not self-confident. I think that I have a massive thing in my head where I put on that work mode. And when I'm in work mode, I'm confident, I am assertive, I am productive, I am everything that a businesswoman should be and I can switch that on but if you catch me out of work mode I'm very different most of you know that I ride motorbikes and even with the motorbikes and the social aspect of being with other bikers I'm not confident I'm really shy I don't like talking to people and I've got a you know nice group of bikers that I, I work that I ride with and there was a, a time recently where I've always gone to them and, and been in my own little personal mode in my head. I remember once I'd spent all day working. I had done a really hard, heavy day of training and I was exhausted. But I was in work mode and I was confident. I was out there. I was on it. And I went to a bike meet straight after work. And one of my, my bike friends actually picked up on it and he said, you know, what, what's wrong with you today? Like, you know, where's all this come from? Where's all this kind of energy and confidence come from? And I was just like, it's just work mode. And as soon as that work mode wore off, as I kind of settled into bike mode, I became that shy, not confident person again. It's weird. I do have a massive work mode, personal mode sort of difference because I'm not a confident person at all. But see, this is what I think needs to be spoke about more because there will be people listening to this that will have previously thought, I can't do what Laura does. I'm not confident enough. And they will hear you say this and they will now think, 
Oh, you don't have to be confident to do what Laura does, or whatever the, the word you want to switch with confidence is. But because you're talking about this stuff, you're showing people that they can. Mm -hmm. you, you almost have to put on that front. And Lou used to tell me, not fake it till you make it, but fake it until you become it. And at first it was a case of just pretending that I'm confident, pretending that I know what I'm talking about. And now that work mode comes a bit more naturally. And when I'm in work mode, that, that work mode comes on and that comes, becomes more natural. But um, anyone can do anything. You really can. It's only our own self-confidence and self-doubt that stops us. But it's an interesting one. What is, here's a question for you. What does your self-confidence stop you from doing sometimes? Is there anything that you're prevented of doing because of X, Y, Z? I think the best, I think I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way, but I will answer it. So I'm not a confident person, like at all. And I think that surprises people sometimes. But what I am good at is knowing what I'm good at. Mm. So there's a certainty without the confidence. So I can come down. I know that I can drive down to Peterborough with a couple of microphones, sit in a hotel room and, and record this for you and know that I can get some good quality. It's not confidence. It's a knowledge. I'm not confident doing it. I just know that I can. I've proven that enough times. So when I've got a certainty to fall back on, Confidence doesn't stop me because it's knowledge, not a confidence. When I'm relying on confidence, it can stop me doing all sorts of things. And the way that I can get around that is looking at the potential outcome. The example that springs to mind, actually, that, you know, people will probably laugh at this example, but dating, asking someone out on a date, right? Many people find that terrifying. In principle, I find that terrifying. But the reason I don't need to rely on self-confidence is by looking at the conceivable outcomes. So there's three conceivable outcomes if I ask someone on a date. They're going to say yes. Excellent. That's the result I wanted. They will say no. Excellent. I know where I stand. Or they'll do something else. You know, it'll be an alternative. And great. Well, I know where I stand again. So I genuinely once asked someone out and they said, why would I go out with someone that looks like you? And I'm like, I'm so glad you've said that because there is no way I would want to go out with someone that really, you know, is like you. Thank I didn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. Thank you so much. You have just saved me a world of pain. And when you can look at the outcome and, and see it like that, it's a lot easier. So I think that maybe the self-confidence doesn't stop me doing that much because I found these two life hacks. When I'm certain I can do it, the confidence is irrelevant because I know I can do it, even if I'm not confident doing it. And when I can see what the outcomes can be and how, to be fair, they're not that bad. Well, again, going on stage at the expo, I was terrified there. What's the worst that would happen? I would fall over. Well, that's great content. <laughs> My downloads would skyrocket if someone filmed me going over on stage. Do you know what? Slightly off topic, but I fell off my bike a few weeks ago. And I did it leaving a massive bike meet in front of a hundred instructors, a hundred of bikers. And I, and I came off my bike, I fell off and my camera was recording and I had the content and I put that all over my social media on my bike sort of social media. And the views were just, I had over 20,000 likes on this post and I was just like, well, where did that come from? It's good content. And I think actually being able to I was going to say being able to laugh at your own mistakes, but being able to own your mistakes and being able to own it when you've messed up. And I had comments on that saying, you're a female, you shouldn't be riding a bike. Oh, that bike is clearly too much for you. Or the, it's like, <laughs> and I just thought, I don't care what you say, because actually for the last four years, that's the only time I've actually come off in that sense, in, in the way I did. And actually for four years of riding compared to that one big mistake, it wasn't, it wasn't even a big mistake. But, you know, in terms of one mistake, I'll take that. You know, I'll take the four years of riding. 
So I think being able to to own your mistakes and being able to handle the criticism that you may face and being able to kind of shrug that off, laugh that off and being able to respond to that in a positive way, in a sense, because actually the people who make those sort of negative comments, there's normally a way around them and and being able to sort of talk to them and, and whatnot, but it's maybe another story. But I... I also think having the right people around you, because let's say, let me think of an example. Let's say I wanted to start doing short video clips for Go Green and I wanted to be talking to camera or doing it with a guest who comes in and gives me some of their tips. And and then I did a couple and they were really bad but I wanted to carry on doing them. I know that I can come to you, Terry, and say, look, you're the sort of person who makes these things. How can I get better at that? So yeah, okay, I failed at doing one thing, but so I know who I can go and speak to if I want to improve that. Every six months, we encourage our instructors. So for those who don't know, we run a driving school locally in Peterborough and the surrounding areas. We've got uh, seven or eight instructors who work with us. And every six months or so, we encourage them to do a mock part one test. Now, if they went and failed that, or if even I went and did a a mock part one and failed, or if I had a particular question where I thought that just doesn't make sense, and I don't understand why it doesn't make sense, if I couldn't get my head around it. I know that, for example, Chris Benstead, he does all the theory side of things. and He's good at that and he explains it in a good way. I know that, okay, yeah, I failed on a question. I didn't understand a question. That didn't make sense. But I know someone who can help me. It goes for anything. I could give you so many examples. I know of people within the industry or even outside the industry that if I was struggling with something or failed on something, I know that I've got people who are knowledgeable enough to help me with that. Again, maybe it's an off-topic example, but my motorbike, some of you may have seen my Facebook post, but uh, about three weeks ago, my motorbike got stolen. And I did everything I thought I could. I had it locked up. I parked it in front of CCTV outside a hotel. I kind of tried to hide it between two big transit vans, like, and the transit vans weren't related by the way to the theft, but I tried to keep it obscure. I I parked it in front of CCTV. I locked it up. I had a tracker fitted. And then when the thieves nicked it, they used an angle grinder on the locks. They just took the bike. They hot wired it. They searched the bike, found a tracker, ripped the tracker out and dumped the tracker and then obviously took the bike and I don't know where my bike is. So I then, for me, that was a fail. What could I have done differently? I managed to allow my bike to be stolen despite thinking I had done everything I could have. But I have a friend, a motorbike friend who works with trackers and I said, what can I do next time? Because I can't, I can't let that happen again. And he gave me some really good tips about having two trackers, hiding one of them, disguising them, you know, all sorts of things. Things that I hadn't considered, but knowing who you can go to to get advice and support with various different things. And if you're sitting there thinking you failed with a certain subject or a certain thing, but you don't know who to talk to, come and talk to myself or Terry. Both of us are pretty knowledgeable within the industry about who knows what. So even if you're not sure who to talk to, come and talk to myself or Terry. Either we'll give you some advice or we'll know someone who can. And we can always signpost you to further people or resources or, or anything like that. I've so, just kind of like volunteered you up for that. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think that example with the bike is a brilliant example because as you were describing the precaution you'd taken, I'm thinking, well, what else could you do? Yeah. But there was something else you could have done. So, you know, whilst you, we you don't, don't know what you don't know. Exactly. We don't, we don't want that fail. But you've now learned something positive from that fail. And I think that's the way we need to look at it. No one wants to fail. You know, I didn't want to fail my standards check. It's a bit of me that wishes I had. Because I would have done more earlier. Now, I'm not one for another story. I'm not doing a great story now. But also you mentioned about negativity you face. And I think this is worth mentioning because that is that vulnerability. Why don't people always share the, 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 the negative stories? Because the concern of them being attacked for it. I mean, people are generally a lot, of, from my experience, are a lot less likely to attack you if you're being open and honest and vulnerable than actually if you're showcasing somewhere. So, but also, you know, think about what what you handle, how you handle your students when they talk about the the person that beeps behind you. You know, it's like 
How many people haven't beeped at you today? <laughs> we, we've lost count, there's that many. Do you know what? Lou always used to have a really good way of turning the driving test around. So, of course, we know that if you get 50 or oh, well, 16 faults or more, you fail the driving test. And it's a very fault-focused industry. You know, we pick up on faults. They can't get more than 15 faults on a driving test. And we're always looking at faults. Now, Lou always used to say, what if you had to get 16 or more gold stars to pass? So you get one gold star for doing something good, something that impressed the examiner. If you had to get 16 or more gold stars to pass, you'd be looking at that test with a different focus. And I said to one of my pupils once, if you had to you know, get 16 or more gold stars to pass, would that change your, your outlook on the driving test? And he said, yeah, try a lot harder. I was like, so why aren't you trying hard now to avoid the faults? And he was like, it's just not worth it. But if I had to impress the examiner and get 15 or more or 16 gold stars, I would try to do that and I would make more of an effort. And that was really interesting. But changing the focus is, is different. It's harder to try not to do something <laughs> than it is to try to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, to, to wrap up this episode then, because as much as I consider failure to be quite a positive mm -hmm. thing in a lot of ways it's also negative mm -hmm. so let's finish with some positive mm -hmm. let's talk about some of the things we like from the industry what stand what stand, what jumps out to you straight away when i say that community and i know we've kind of touched on this already but the people around us in general and i know there's a good and bad out there but i i do feel like the instructor community is is good for example, when I had a rear shunt a few years ago, I was pulled up at the side of the road with my car and another car, me and the pupil at the side of the road, another instructor passed and sort of stopped and said, you know, do you need anything? Do you need help? And locally with Peterborough, we've got a lovely Facebook group with local instructors and they're always kind of talking to each other. They go for nights out, n nights out, et cetera. Um, if they've got test swap, if they, if they have a bit of advice they need, if they've broken down, if someone's seen a brake light out on another instructor's car they, and I just I like that community feel like you've got people around you and also on the wider social media in the wider industry you've got people around you things like the conferences that, that happen every year so like the intelligent instructor the ADI and JC conference in a couple of weeks again it's a, it's a good community you've got lots of different trades and people coming together companies businesses I think it's just lovely to have that community and also it's worth mentioning, Lou obviously had the big learner relay. And again, that brought the, the community, the instructor community together so much. And, you know, that was a lovely thing. So I think there's a real community feel around being an instructor. And that's a privilege to be a part of. I think sometimes we underestimate people. There are, there are a lot of good people out there. A lot of dicks as well. <laughs> but if someone went on to one of the Facebook groups today, an instructor, and said, I'm struggling, can someone help me? Yes, there'll be people that try and sell them a course. Yes, there'll be people that tell them spelt struggling wrong. <laughs> but there will also be some genuine people that go out there and say, yeah. yeah. And, and kind of leave it as simple as that. And I think we underestimate that sometimes. We expect everyone to be the dick or to be the grammar police or, or, or whatever. But there are good people out there. I think you're right. I think one that I'll mention personally, it's moments. I've spoke about this before, but it's like when a student passes a test, obviously I love it. That's, that's the, the, so a lot of ways to them, that's the end result, you know, and I, but that's not where I get my kicks. It's little things that uh, I had this, I happen, say this happened the other day, it happens every week, but a student, I, I think she'd just done a roundabout really well. And she had this little smile and I went, I can see that smile. And it went into a big grin and she's like, oh, I did that really well. And I'm like, yeah, you did. Of course you did. And it's those little moments. It's when you do a roundabout well or your parallel park well or they get a theory test question right that they'd been struggling with or something clicks and you can just see, and it might last for a second or five seconds. They're the best moments for me. They're what make the job because they, they reoccur. Reoccur? Recur. Recur? Yeah. Recur? yeah. They recur. <laughs> I, I love that and I, I absolutely get what you mean. And 
Another thing that I, I love is, again, I, I feel like I'm in a privileged position where I train PDIs. But then because I've now been doing this for eight years, I have seen the PDIs that I trained growing up, if you like, within the industry. I'm going to take this lady as an example. I'm sure she won't mind. So some of you may know Becky Seaton. I remember Becky, bless her, I know she talks openly about her fails when she was a PDI and she struggled to qualify. And Becky and I, we, we spoke quite a lot when she was training and I know she also sought training from elsewhere. And she, she then eventually qualified and it's been lovely to kind of keep in touch with her and also just, you know, looking at the things that she's posted on Facebook and looking at how she's grown within the industry and now she's training PDIs herself. And that's a real lovely feeling to know that I've been a small part in, in her journey and I'm not saying that you know it was all me that she qualified you know, she she had a lot of input from different trainers she she put in a lot of work herself and she did a good job so but it was just lovely to know that I've been a small part of that qualifying process for her and with her and she's then grown up if you like within the industry she's now training PDIs and she's she's doing a cracking job and there's other PDIs who have qualified. They've gone on to do fleet work. They've gone on to even be audits. They've gone on to do all sorts of different things. And some of them have gone on to train PDIs, ADIs, and do other sort of big things. And I love that. And also learners as well, pupils who pass their tests with us. And they've gone on to then be police officers, for example, and then driving on blue lights and that sort of thing. There's so many different directions people can go in terms of fleet audit pdi adi training and whatnot i'm sure there's loads more but i do like that feeling knowing that i've been a small part of someone's journey and they've kind of grown up within the industry and that's a real privilege to just sit back and watch and just to feel honored and be proud of them I'm going to share that one, actually. Mine's a bit more niche in, I, I get such a buzz when someone messages me and say that I've just signed up to this thing that I found on your podcast. You know, so if someone messaged me and said, oh, I've, I've got to join Go Green because I've been listening. I would love that. Anyone that, any time that someone appearing on the podcast gets custom or follows or whatever as a result of coming on the podcast is just the biggest thing for me because that's the thing I do it for to showcase a guest so when the guest gets something as a result of coming on even if it's just a follow or a message I encourage all guests uh, sorry all listeners to reach out to the guests that have been on the show even if they don't you know get anything from them to reach out and say oh I really enjoyed this episode of you on the show the podcast thank you very few do it and that's fine I don't do it with a lot of the podcasts I listen to but I encourage people to do it where you can because what a great feeling it must be for that guest if someone reaches out and says that, but I've got a very specific one as well for the learner, like, like you mentioned, which is, it's going back about pre-COVID, this actually, pre-COVID. She failed her first attempt at the test and was devastated because her sister passed first time. I didn't teach her sister, I taught her, but her sister was taught to teach her to pass a test. You know, all the test routes, all that kind of stuff. And I taught my student properly. So. My student passed second time. And for the next year, she used to send me pictures of everywhere she'd been. She went like as far as Scotland and drove up there. And she sent me pictures of herself next to signs. Like, I'm here now, I'm here now. And every time I used to text her back and say, has your sister yet left Bradford yet? And it'll be, no, no. And that went on for like a year, just sending me like these things. And I just thought, that's possibly the most rewarding post-test result I've had in that a sister that she was devastated to pass before her because she'd failed still hadn't left Bradford while she was driving to Scotland and back. Do you know what? You, you've kind of got me thinking there about some of the pupils that I've, I've taught, and there are definitely some, some good memories. And I think we underestimate how much influence we have on a pupil. Uh, Decalion says, you know, people are always going to remember their driving instructor, and it's up to you whether they remember you for the good reasons or the bad reasons, for the right or the wrong reason. And I, I had a pupil who I taught, yeah, it was pre-COVID years ago, probably six years ago now. 
And long story short, she was learning. And then we had the six week summer holidays. Now at the time, my daughter was about six, six years old. And I said to my pupil, look, I can't do lessons during the week because my daughter, she, obviously I can't leave her home alone. And I said, the only option would be that if we just maybe did an hour lesson and my daughter was to sit in the lesson. And she was like, I'd love that. And I'm not going to get into this conversation now, but having children in the car on lessons is okay. It is acceptable and you can do it. And it's a really good learning opportunity for many reasons. And that's a whole nother conversation, which I could spend a good hour talking about. But anyway, my, some people might think it's not professional and I'm going to just put a little bit of a, a pin in that, a flag in that, if you like, that it's okay. That's one of my favorite things is different types of lessons and having children in the car and passengers and whatnot. I get sad when, do you know what? I'm not going to start because I will, I will go on a tangent, but this people, so one lesson a week, just an hour a week, we did throughout summer holidays. And my daughter was in those lessons. And my daughter being six, I just gave her pen and paper in the back. You can do some drawings, blah, blah, blah. My daughter wrote the pupil a note. They actually got on really well. And my daughter wrote the pupil a note saying, well done on passing your tests. Because she passed and my daughter wrote her note. And I had completely forgotten about this. And now that pupil messaged me literally about two months ago. And she said, I've still got the note. And she sent me a picture. And I, it was a real like, whoa. You know, the people remembered those lessons so fondly. And she still got the note from my daughter stuck on her fridge because she loved those lessons. They got on really well. And they were the most memorable lessons for her. Um, and she loved them. She enjoyed them. And I'm not going to say I'd forgotten the lessons. I remember the lessons. But I'd forgotten that my daughter had written that note. And I didn't realize how much that meant to that pupil and that was a real nice little feeling <laughs> see i don't i think that's the perfect point to finish this episode having said that i am gonna say one other thing because we're talking about the moments of of, of what we like about the industry and this kind of stuff and it's like what i like is that i can reach out to someone like yourself and say right shall we do this thing where i come down for two days and we just spend a day together recording and see what happens and you're like yeah let's do it and then you go can we get some structure and i say yeah, but we've got three months to get a structure. Let's leave it. And then two days before, I'll say, shall we do the, you're like, shall we do the structure? now? let's do the structure. Then we come down and I change it all again. And it's, that's, that's what I love, that there are people like you that are willing to do this and, and step in and be like, okay, cool. Now, yes, of course, you get some benefits as well as that. You get to spend time with me. What more could you want? <laughs> but you're not doing it for that reason necessarily. You're doing it, well, for every reason you're doing it. But it's like, how cool is it that there's people that are willing to do this? So I think, and I could be wrong, so, you know, <laughs> but I think this is the last episode of recording. So perfect opportunity for to say thank you for doing this. I've really enjoyed doing this and I'm, I'm looking forward, no offence to you, I'm looking forward to doing it with others as well. <laughs> it has been good. And I know that when we was talking about it initially, it was something that you hadn't done before in terms of recording everything at once. And we have literally spent the last two days together recording all of these episodes and it's been different for me as well because I I don't tend to well I don't ever really record podcasts I've only ever done a couple it's not my favorite thing to do but actually I was a bit nervous about doing all of this but actually it's been fun and I've enjoyed it my only thing that has annoyed me is that you chose a hotel next to a Starbucks not a Costa <laughs> The, the hotel next to the Costa had no places left <laughs> because I booked it the night before I had to come down, which is why it costs more and what I do every single time whenever I go anywhere. But no, it has been good. But the last, the very last thing I will mention is that you say that we've spent the entire day recording this. Well, let's be honest. We spent an hour with recording an episode, then spent an hour talking about all the stuff we're not allowed to put in an episode that cannot possibly go public. So the, the 12 hours of talking time we've had has actually been six hours of recording and, and an hour in between of mm -hmm. inappropriate, indecent material. <laughs> yeah, things that, that can't be broadcast. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, no, big thank you for joining me. Genuinely enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for joining me on this episode and thank you for joining me on all the others. And if I've done this prematurely and we've got another one, well, I'll say it again in a minute. <laughs> That's been great. Thank you ever so much, Terry. So as always, a big thank you to Laura Morris for joining me on this episode, this fifth episode of uh, In Conversation with Laura Morris. 
Now, at the end of the episode there, you'll you'll have heard me wrap up the conversation with Laura as if it was the last episode. Well, you can call that a fail because I did and it wasn't because I didn't want the last episode in this season to be about failure. That didn't quite feel right to me. So I swapped some episodes around and there's still another one to come. But I do hope you enjoyed this one as always and your feedback is welcome both on this episode on the the in conversation with as a whole and also on your thoughts on dropping every episode on the same day but do want to point in the direction of bright coaching because they have taken their accredited qualification in coaching behavioral change and driver psychology they've taken it online so previously it was all in person driving up to scotland to do that or if you lived in scotland driving in scotland to do that but they've taken it online and that's kicking off on october the 31st which is halloween the second greatest day of the year so yeah go and check it out at brightcoaching.net see if that's something you can get involved in and while you're over there make sure you sign up to their newsletter as well but i also want you to mention the premium content and i want to mention specifically the interactive tier so with the interactive tier, you get all the content that has gone on on all the other tiers, but you also get to be a bit more interactive. For example, every month I host four open Zoom rooms. Now these are, I call them problem solvers, but they're basically asking me anything when you come along, ask your questions and get your problems solved. That could be from me or it could be from anyone else that is there. We also give you the opportunity to come along to some of the podcasts that are being recorded live. So you can come along to things like the green room and watch them. You can contribute in the chat or if you're so inclined, you can jump on and share a question or some thoughts on that as well. Plus, you also get exclusive access to the expert sessions. Expert sessions are presentations delivered by, well, experts. And we've had some wonderful ones on over the past couple of years we've had the very first one was chris spencer talking about roundabouts we've had people like emma cottington phil cowley ray seagrave and some other wonderful people delivering those and we've got some more ones to come soon including lee sperry he's wrapping up our standards check expert session trilogy that he's done followed up again by chris spencer who's doing the conversation around the standards check one so you can sign up to the interactive tier it is more expensive it is the higher price tier but you can sign up and you get access to all this stuff. Plus, you can always drop back down. So you can sign up, you can upgrade your CPD and do all this awesome stuff for a few months. And then if you need to save a few quid or you're a bit CPD'd out, you could drop down a tier to the lower tier and then move back up and then drop down. You get the idea. I really would encourage you to do that. The feedback we get from the stuff that goes on over there is phenomenal. It's one of the the things I'm most proud of, and uh, you can probably hear it in my voice. So go and check it out, www.theinstructorpodcast.com. But for now, let's just keep raising standards. The Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. Okay, uh, say some words to me. Hello. <laughs> I, mean, I never know word. what to say. Say fucking a sentence. You're careful of stringing one together. I don't know. I... <laughs> <laughs> My name is Laura. I just, just more than one word. I just uh, I feel silly when I, I have nothing to say. I have to talk with a purpose. That clip is getting edited and put in at the end of the episode as like bonus content. <laughs>